Hey, welcome to Living the Next Chapter. I have with me Doug Wiseman on today, and Doug is in sunny LA joining us, and we're going to talk about his writing career. He's a fiction author, a screenwriter, and a travel writer. How's that? That's a great combo, right? And he shares how, in this podcast episode, he shares how a movie started his writing career. Interesting, right? What was the movie? Ah, you're going to have to stick around. Here we go. Living the Next Chapter, Doug Wiseman. Welcome to Living the Next Chapter. I'm glad you're here. Here we go. There are plenty of examples of beats that you have to hit in storytelling, and there are plenty of people who map those beats out. The most famous example is going to be Save the Cat, right? Where, and, and it's specifically related towards screenwriting, but it works in in books and whatever type of writing you're doing as well. And the big idea is that in the first few minutes or first few pages or whatever story you're telling, you have the character do something that's endearing to the audience in order to gain their trust, even though they know nothing about the character at this time. So that's the save the cat is the idea, right? They save the cat, you automatically love this character. But the big thing for me is that no matter where you're starting on the emotional journey, it has to be a journey. The character has to change in some way throughout the journey in order for you to really resonate with the story. So if they're the same at the beginning as they are at the end, you're kind of just thinking, well, why did I go on this journey with this character? I just spent 300 characters and we're in the same place as where we started. Well, usually the rule is you can see it. And if you haven't noticed before, you're going to start noticing now. If you start in a high place in a story, like the person's on top of the world, millions of dollars has everything they want. By the end of the story, they're probably going to be impoverished. Or if they start impoverished by the end of the story, they're probably going to have millions of dollars. So they're going to gain, and that could be the thing they want, or they just gain it along the way. But that's the idea is that the emotional journey are the steps they take to get to what they want and how they overcome the barriers in between. Okay, welcome to Living the Next Chapter, the podcast where we talk to amazing authors Hint, hint, nudge, nudge, um, from around the world, and we get to share their story, their process of writing, all those great things. Douglas is on with me today. Douglas is an author who loves to do fiction, screenwriting, travel writing. I'm, I have his website up here, and uh, it's amazing. All the links in the show notes. Douglas, welcome to the podcast. It's so great to have you. Thank you. I'm so excited to be here. And uh, yeah, we've we've uh, we've had a great conversation already. And we're kind of circling back to do the recording now. I love having this kind of pre-chat before we record to get to learn a little bit more about you. But can you let people know a little bit about, first, uh, where you are in the world? I always love that. And um, maybe what did you get started writing in first? Fiction, screenwriter, or travel writing? Yeah, well, I'm currently in the Los Angeles area. And... As a travel writer, I actually get asked that question a lot of where are you in the world, especially by my parents. So it was <laughs> really comforting for them when I bought a house and settled down somewhat close to them. I'm about a 12 minute drive door to door. So they are they were very excited about that when, when they could say, I know exactly where you are for a little while. Very helpful. But I got started in the writing area with fiction predominantly. I was young. I was in eight I was eight or nine years old when I wrote my first story and the teacher loved it so much that she had me read it to the class and then I kind of put it aside for a while I loved stories but I didn't really write anything for a while until I was in high school and then one day I just saw this movie that really sparked some ideas and I just sat down and wrote and I wrote and I wrote I filled one of those wide line journals I think in a night and looking back I couldn't even read my own writing. I still have trouble reading my own writing, but it was just the it was just the process and the act of writing that got me started. And then in college, I continued on that vein. I tried to ignore it for a while, thinking there's no future in writing. What is that yeah. about? I'm going to work in a bank, but that would just kill my soul. It's fine for people. I just that's not for me. Yeah. And I came to travel writing a little indirectly because I traveled so much and I was keeping a blog so my family and friends back home could keep track of me. But it wasn't until about 2013, I found an ad on Craigslist asking for travel stories. And I had been to all the places they were recommending or or suggested for people to turn in stories about. And I just kind of polished up a, a blog article as a sample. And they're like, yeah, great, come on board. And so I just have been doing that. And that was really 
what was able to sustain me predominantly, which is amazing as, as, as a writer and as a travel writer, as something that I know people want to try and pursue. And I was kind of like, oh, let me just fall into this hole and, and see where it takes me. <laughs> okay. So let's jump back. You said something near the beginning. There was a movie that sparked all this. What was the movie? <laughs> It was actually A Knight's Tale, which I don't know if oh, yeah. people have seen it or if people find it so engaging, but what for whatever reason, it just really resonated with me as a high school student, kind of closely associated with Heath Ledger and his his yeah. swag, and then the way that they were mixing that contemporary ambiance with medieval folklore. It was just this really passionate story that I that I connected with, even though like when I say that it's one of the best movies ever made, no, but I really enjoyed it. And that's the thing about storytelling is something that really connects with you might be something off the rails for somebody else. They might not even, it might, it might not even register with them. But for me, that was the one. That's interesting, right? And it's probably like a combination of the movie, the time, what was going on in your life, all those things, all in one big melting pot. And the movie just comes out of the right spot and just connects. And that's what I love about authors is you guys, you're writing books and you're connecting with an audience and you just, you get this perfect mixture of, of readership and authorship, all kind of blending together at the right moment. And, you know, somebody finds your, your stuff. Tell me a little bit about some of the early days of your writing and some of the feedback that's kind of helped you as an author to be, to improve and to get better. Oh, wow. That, that is actually scary more than anything. So I, uh, so I think I was, when I was in high school and I started writing, I would share with people I shared with like my girlfriend at the time, or I shared with these really close friends who didn't know anything about writing. I didn't know anything about writing, but I just, I wanted to share it with someone. And so the feedback was very minimal, like this is great or wow. And so it was, <laughs> but then when I got into university and I started taking writing courses and learning the actual techniques and elements of writing, I was, I was terrible. I mean, it was, it was still terrible, but I acknowledge now what was terrible about it. And I was writing from a sense of what I thought I was supposed to do as opposed to what I wanted to do. So I'm a funny person. I get told that all the time. I'm very friendly and I like, I have this kind of happy atmosphere around me, but I don't write that way. But because I act that way and I am that way in life, I thought that I had to write like that. I thought everything I wrote had to be comical or had to have this punchline. And it really hindered my writing because I didn't know how to translate that into a story, but I also didn't want to tell that story. And once I got to this place where I was telling the story I wanted to tell, how I wanted to tell it, I felt far more comfortable to experiment and to actually write the way I wanted to. I like I like complex stories. I like surreal aspects. Magical realism is is somewhere something that I always find comforting to me. And and these things that are a bit whimsical, even in dramatic storytelling. That's what I love, but I didn't know how to write that. So it took me a while to really engage with that. And a lot of the comments I would get were like, is this a punchline? Or I had this incredibly supportive instructor who I would, I, I don't think I could be as in supportive with my writing as he was with mine, even though I know how terrible it was. And he was really encouraging me to like, oh, go deeper with this. You have an interesting metaphor here, or you have this interesting character where I can find these details about them. And they were things I didn't even recognize. So either he was being very generous or he saw these things in the writing that I wasn't even capable of seeing at the time because of my knowledge or because of what I thought I was supposed to write. And it really encouraged me to just keep going and pushing forward. So, okay, in those days when you're early days of writing and you're, you're, you're kind of personality wise, you're this way, but you're writing this way was yeah. a little bit of imposter syndrome kind of creeping in there. Like how... How can I write like this if I'm more like this as a person? Did that kind of get a little confusing then? It definitely got confusing. And and part of that was because this idea that you know I might project this one thing, but writing is an outlet for me. It's an emotional outlet. So it's a place that I feel comfortable giving space to that vulnerability or authenticity that I might not feel comfortable doing in person. And once I was able to bridge those two feelings, I was able to write my best and because I was understanding that I need to be vulnerable in my writing. I need to be expressive and emotive in my writing. And I need to find ways that demonstrate how and why my characters are open with the reader. Because if I don't do that, the reader is not going to sense that and they're going to close the book and go somewhere else. So tell me a little bit, like on, I'm on your website again, as we talk, 
tell me a little bit about your screenwriting background. What what is involved in that? Screenwriting's a different animal, but still storytelling. And I just am a fan of telling stories, no matter the medium. But when it comes to say, let's let's go all the way back to to a Knight's Tale again, right? It was a movie, and it was really understanding the components of what a good movie is, and that was like the visual reference I had, as opposed to the books was kind of this emotional reference that I had. And I worked with this one production company, mostly doing music videos and things, but also these kind of side uh, corporate storytelling projects and writing scripts for them. It was really interesting to try and see how to tell a brand story, but the arc that these corporations want to tell themselves. So it wasn't outward facing, it was inward facing. But where is their story arc? What is the emotional components they want to share? And how does that relate to a larger film because it's supposed to resonate with the workers and employees at the corporation but at the same time it speaks to the broader form of storytelling and and screenwriting and so I took that aspect out into the world and with a close friend of mine who was the owner of that company he once told me a story or not told me a story he was explaining all of the writers slash directors who threw their hat into the ring to to direct Indiana Jones 4. And we were talking about like, well, that was a movie that exactly a lot of people are like, uh, but I thought I heard him say Quentin Tarantino threw his hat in the ring. And I'm like, what would that movie have been like if Tarantino had thrown his hat into the ring? And it got me started on this idea of Quentin Tarantino directing an Indiana Jones movie. What would it look like? And so I just wrote like a five minute short, like Quentin Tarantino has these incredible compelling openings that I love and they're all like five to seven minutes they're longer than most movie openings and so I just wrote that opening you know what would happen and so it's kind of like Pulp Fiction meets Indiana Jones meets Casablanca rolled in and I just fell in love with it and showed it to my friend and he's like oh this is incredible and it got us on this whole idea of movie mashups but we never took it farther excuse me we never took it further because What happened was we learned that homage is considered covered by copyright. So like if we, so we wouldn't be able to do it because it would be infringing on the intellectual property. But if we did parody, so if we did something funny, it's totally covered and we don't have to worry about getting sued. But if we're doing something homage, like to these movies or directors, we could get sued. So we never pushed it further. But with it, I just found more and more stories to continue telling and in a completely different way and it's a completely different part of my brain because with novel writing I'm looking at how can I get the reader into this character's head space and connect deeply by seeing the world through their eyes and through their head and in a movie I'm like well how can I visually tell this story as opposed to telling it through the eyes of the character so it, it's Totally different. Mm. I love it. I love them both for different reasons, but one is they're immersive for different reasons, right? One, I'm immersed in the vision of it, the screenwriting. I'm immersed in the vision of the storytelling, where the other one, I'm trying to tell you and immerse you through like sensory details that you can know. If I say lemon, your mouth is going to water. So I'm going to use that. If I say, yeah, it says, yeah. right, it started yeah, watering. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. If I say like the smell of burnt wood, you're going to get connected to a memory of burnt wood. And then I'm going to have to try and connect that to what the memory of this character or what this character is feeling. So it's not visual. It's actually a different sense that I'm, or different senses that I'm working with. Okay. So let's jump back to story arc. You got, there's so much here that I'm, I'm loving. I love listening. To. Um, story <laughs> arc. Complex. What, <laughs> what, what are, what are some key elements to a good story arc, whether you're writing for screenwriting, whether you're writing for fiction, What are some of the things that you kind of make sure, like if you had a list of things that you want to kind of check off during a story arc, what kind of things stick out to you that are really important? Well, it's the the emotional journey. I mean, there's, for instance, one of the things, well, not for instance, but there are plenty of examples of beats that you have to hit in storytelling. And there are plenty of people who map those beats out. The most famous example is going to be Save the Cat, right? Where... And, and it's specifically related towards screenwriting, but it works in in books and whatever type of writing you're doing as well. And the big idea is that in the first few minutes or first few pages or whatever story you're telling, you have the character do something that's endearing to the audience 
in order to gain their trust, even though they know nothing about the character at this time. So that's the save the cat is the idea, right? They save the cat. You automatically love this character. Mm -hmm. But the big thing for me is that no matter where you're starting on the emotional journey, it has to be a journey. The character has to change in some way throughout the journey in order for you to really resonate with the story. So if they're the same at the beginning as they are at the end, you're kind of just thinking, well, why did I go on this journey with this character? I just spent 300 characters and we're in the same place as where we started. Well, usually the rule is you can see it. And if you haven't noticed before, you're going to start noticing now. If you start in a high place in a story, like the person's on top of the world, millions of dollars has everything they want. By the end of the story, they're probably going to be impoverished. Or if they start impoverished by the end of the story, they're probably going to have millions of dollars. So they're going to gain. And that could be the thing they want, or they just gain it along the way. But that's the idea is that the emotional journey are the steps they take to get to what they want and how they overcome the barriers in between. That's so well described. I love it. That's that's exactly what I was hoping to hear. That's really good. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, just so you know, we didn't talk about that no, before, everybody. That no, was just is, something we came up with. When you have an expert on your podcast and they just bring great stuff. It's awesome. Um, is there is there anything through your website or other stuff for any screenwriters out there where they can see your work or kind of experience a little bit of that? So with screenwriting, unfortunately not. It's all protected in-house and the movies that I've been working on haven't been greenlit and out there in the world. I'm always happy to talk screenwriting and those stories with people if they want to reach out to me. When it comes to other types of writing, whether it's travel essays, nonfiction, or fiction, the I'm I'm out there. My website's there. I'm really active on LinkedIn and I can I'm always happy if people reach out to me, whether it's through the website, through my email, through LinkedIn, through Facebook, Instagram, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. I'm always happy to talk shop, share my writing and and demonstrate kind of my form of storytelling and how it adheres to and even breaks the rules awesome we have your we'll have your links to your website i did have an uh a screenwriter on earlier on in this podcast series and uh she wrote a, a movie and got it on netflix and she took us yeah. through the whole journey of that and yes. so it's kind of i just if you had something available for everybody to see i would love to point them in the direction but the website is awesome for that Let's talk about your your newest book that just came out. And we jokingly talked before we hit record that you have officially sold out. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, in a good way, because your book has people are calling you and say, hey, Douglas, I can't get your book. What's going on here, man? And the problem is, what happened? Yeah, all the copies that were printed sold out. Sold out. So you're a sellout. I, I am officially a sellout and <laughs> I couldn't stop smiling. I love it. <laughs> so let's talk about the book. Let's talk about uh, the title and how you got the idea for this. Gladly. Yeah. Life Between Seconds is the title. And when we talk, you were just talking about the screenwriter who was on and walked through the whole Netflix journey, which is incredible. And I need to take a listen to that because that would be such a great journey to hear. I had a big journey with Life Between Seconds. It took me 11 years to finally get out into the world. I started writing it in 2011. I finished the first draft in 2013. And then since then, it's all about revisions, querying agents, querying publishing houses, revising again, until I finally found an independent publishing house that would take it. And that was in 2000, I think 2019. Uh, it was maybe early 2019. And then from there, the process of actually getting it published, when the publishing date would be, the edits that it took along that route, getting confirmation on the cover page, all those various details until, boom, it hit the world. And I've been excited ever since. It came out November 15th. But the thing that inspired that was I'm a traveler. I travel. I love it. It's one of the things that have really driven me because of As I say on the website, it it really builds bridges between communities and cultures. And there are things that I would not have known or understood if I was not out there in the world, not just on a cruise or, you know, on a weekend trip to Cabo. Just I say Cabo because it's close to Los Angeles. You can fly there easily. But it, it just sets up this new perspective that I would not have had otherwise. And that's what set up this book. I was in Buenos Aires and... I watched the Madres de la Plaza de Mayo walk through the main plaza, demanding information on 
with the, bear, the whereabouts of their loved ones, whether it was their sons or husbands or daughters or uncles and brothers. They walked with signs, silently marching after decades of not knowing. It was, and then started in the 1970s after the military junta started disappearing people that were students or political dissidents, et cetera. And they were still doing it and they still had no idea where by they still doing it, I mean the Madres de la Plaza de Mayo were still marching and still demanding information on the whereabouts, still not knowing after all this time. And it really sparked something in me and it connected. I'm Jewish, so it really resonated with this kind of parallel of the Holocaust and mm. those people I know who were affected, the family members or friends of family, et cetera. And then talking to more people and researching more and learning more about it, I really wanted to share this story from the point of view of, of someone who lived it, not someone disappeared, but someone affected by the loss of someone who was disappeared. But I also was so new to this concept that I kind of needed a gateway into that. And so I used two characters, Peter, who's a 20 something American, and Sophia, who's a 70-something Argentinian woman. And they meet in San Francisco. And Peter is this veiled version of me when I was younger, in a sense. He was a traveler, and he was always running away from things. And now here he is face-to-face -face with his nightmares and whether he's going to confront them or run away again. And Sophia doing the same thing. But Peter was my Trojan horse into Sophia's story. I was able to use him for myself and for the reader, for people who might not have understood or might not want to know, or might feel too intimidated to know her story. I was like, well, here's someone that you might be able to relate to better. So then we can get to her. That's a very interesting, it's a great visual too, by the way, when you see a Trojan <laughs> horse, that's, that's such a unique way to kind of break through those into that new character, right? And, and kind of expound that in a, in a different way than just the traditional way of, you know, here's character A and yeah. plotting it out you're, you're really kind of building a world around that which i love how did where do we kind of go without giving away everything where do we kind of go within the book um is there any kind of things that you feel really proud of literally that as you writ as you wrote it you're like oh this feels really good this part i love this yeah. part actually there are a few a few moments i there are a few things about the book that I am in love with to this day, not just because they're precious to me because it took me so long, but also because I was really proud of these particular moments, these breakthroughs that really have impacted my writing ever since I made those breakthroughs. I'm sorry, I almost just spilled yeah. my tea. <laughs> I was very, very gesticular. So what happened was I'm I'm not a fan of mystery when I write. I don't do well with trying to keep the reader guessing of what's happening next. It's just not how I am able to plot things out. And because of that, I tell the reader exactly what's happening or what happened up front and then go through the motions of explaining. And now this is how we got to this point. Right. So like, I'll tell you from the get go, Sophia's daughter disappeared. Peter's mother disappeared from his life. And now let's go back and kind of look at how that affected them from point A to get to where we start the story, right? But the way that I plotted it out was I wrote what was interesting to me and then pieced it all together like a puzzle. Oh, this sounds good here. This sounds good here. This works here. But the real intense scenes that I loved were one, I realized, oh, Peter has a teddy bear and that's kept him comfort for all this time and kind of like a security blanket. But why make it just a teddy bear when I could make the teddy bear come to life? So there's this surreal aspect of the teddy bear actually living out in the world. But what world are we existing in when the teddy bear is alive, right? Like, are we in this? Are we in the real life? Are we in this kind of uh, this kind of purgatory when he's talking or exists? And, and how do these worlds connect? Then with Sophia's daughter, there was this one scene that I became obsessed with just because it's two pages and two sentences. So it's wait, and wait, it's, wait, 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 say that again. Two yeah. pages, two, two pages, sentences, two sentences. So it's two sentences that run across these two pages. And I was so proud of this moment because it's breathless and it's supposed to be breathless. And it's this really intense, hard moment in which we're actually kind of seeing what happened to Sophia's daughter. And I didn't really want people to have time to contemplate. I just wanted it to feel as frenetic as it was. And so it's one of those moments where the content 
imitates the form. So I was able to like instill that feeling into this moment by only making it two sentences long, even though you're reading two pages. You try to catch your breath while you're reading yeah, it, right? Exactly. Like, and oh my gosh, 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 oh my gosh. Right. Yeah. So I'm I'm actually really dreading this one moment where I'm reading every page of my novel on Instagram. So it's like I go on five days a week. I put one page. So when I get to that, I'm dreading the point where I get to that part of the story and I have to actually read it out. <laughs> okay, you can take a big breath. Yeah. Here we go. Are, is I'm going to film myself taking that breath. Actually. Are you going to, yeah, just like okay. every, everyone yeah, join with okay. me here. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, is there going to be an audio version of the book at all in the future? I, I want there to be. So okay. my publisher, really small indie press, which I'm so happy to be working with, History of Press, check them out. But because it's such a small press, they don't automatically do the audio rights and I have to find a different subsidiary. However, I am on a mission to get Stanley Tucci to read the book because I am a huge fan of Stanley Tucci. I think he's one of the most talented actors ever. So I just need to get popular enough so Stanley Tucci will hear my plea and also read the book, love it, and want to read it. <laughs> well, you're you're on living the next chapter. I don't know if you can get past this level. This is like yeah, right. you're at the top right now. Yeah, so. top. And I already sold out. So you sold out. Yeah. Next? Yeah. <laughs> well, that would be amazing. Holy cow. Yeah. <laughs> to have that in that voice, that would be that'd be outstanding. Yeah. I mean, he wrote he wrote one of my favorite movies of all time and directed it. So uh, and it's called The Imposters. If you haven't seen it, you should absolutely take a look. But it's just it's one of those movies where I understood. I, I love his his films, everything that he puts out. I love uh, the ones that he writes and directs, and it just shows the rate. Like his range is so incredible. So I, his voice, his acting, the way he can transition between characters, and that is the thing that I think would be so compelling in this audio version. Mm. Yeah. So like I, like I like to listen to audiobooks while I'm doing other stuff, and when I going to hear them in, in a great voice and it's got inflection and it's got emotion it just it feels like you're in there it's that theater of the mind right i love that that kind of right. uh, building that world around me so that's amazing oh that's 100 percent accurate i actually this isn't a, a hill i'm gonna die on but at least at this point in my life i love when writers or authors read their nonfiction books but when voice actors read the fiction books. Mm. Yeah, I would agree with that totally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, yeah, cuz then again you get to you get to pick the voice that you think suits the story and yeah, that's great. That's really really good. Um so okay, so the book is selling like crazy, which is amazing. Um what what's next for you? Like what what are you looking down the road at and what's exciting you in the future? Well, I'm always excited to get my screenplays in front of people. I have this great screenplay that's about this uh, family and friend for hire business. And it was based off of a true story in Atlantic article, maybe four or five years ago. And it's it's this Japanese company and in the, the actual article is a Japanese company where they rent it you know, they become friends or family for hire. That's the whole point. And it's lonely people, or if they want to pretend that they have a partner for their parents or something like that. And I took this concept of like, that's so interesting. And I wrote like, okay, so here's this young woman who wants to meet her father. And the mother knows that like the father's a deadbeat who wants nothing to do with anything. And so she hires this guy to be the fake father. And then <laughs> the girl finds out. So now what happens, right? Uh, so it's, you know, part relationship, part found family, part uh, road trip story, all these things in the one. So I'm always looking at getting that into the world. But I also have another book due for release either. So the, the release date's not set yet, but it's going to be late 2023 or early 2024. And it's about a female serial killer in occupied Paris during World War II. Wait, what? Do that again. <laughs> That sounds uh, amazing. Female serial killer occupied yeah. Paris in World War II. So it's so many things that I love. I mean, who doesn't love a serial killer book? Uh, yeah. Who doesn't love a World War II book? And who doesn't love the the gray area of somebody doing a bad thing for the right reasons? <laughs> it's almost uh, the Dexter effect, right? Actually, that's exactly how I pitched it. Mm. So I pitched it as 
Dexter meets the Nightingale. If anybody read that book, there you go. Great book, by the way. <laughs> that sounds so amazing. Okay, so please put a little pin in that. That when this happens, I'm not going to say if. I'm saying when yeah. that you would come back and talk about that because that would be a great conversation to talk oh, about. I love gladly. history. I love Europe, European history, and all that. So to kind of place that in that time period period as well. Yeah, you got me right there just with that. That sounds really interesting. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's it's that same idea of using the Trojan horse. I mean, I, again, I'm Jewish. I I have heard stories from close people that about their time in the Holocaust, and I've met people, and they've shared their stories. And But at the same time, there are a lot of stories out there, fiction, nonfiction, about people's experiences. So I wanted to kind of do that Trojan horse thing again, where here's a different view of that period and, and how is it going to compel the reader? Awesome. Um, Douglas, I think I could talk to you like all day <laughs> for days on end. You just so much, I think we just kind of like touched a little bit of what we, we wanted to talk about today. Uh, again, I would love to have you back again in the future. So please keep that in mind. Um, share the website. And, um, you know, I want to close off with just, a. Uh, your thoughts on on just encouraging a new author because uh, there's some new authors listening to this, listening to you and being inspired today. I just wanted you to have a chance to speak to them directly. It's kind of me as like a little matchmaker here going on, but how you can encourage a new author to to get just to get start writing. So first start with your website. So my website, douglasweissman.com, real easy to remember as long as you remember my name. And on that website, there are blog posts. I post one blog every month, but it really focuses on different aspects of writing, including things that affect writers, like imposter syndrome. It's not unique to you, I promise. Every writer does go through imposter syndrome, feeling like, what are they doing in that space? They can't tell a story that is new. And let me tell you, no story is new. You know, there's that concept of there's only, what, six actual stories out there, but the real idea is how you approach it. Like, hey, people have seen serial killer stories before. People have seen World War II stories before. But suddenly you put them together and you have something different. The idea is really me on my blog approaching things that can help a writer. And I'm going to be launching a newsletter soon. And it's going to be a $5 subscription. But the whole point is that two times a month, I give practical advice to writing. So it's going to be kind of a masterclass over time that gives you the accountability that most writers need, that most writers don't get. The idea is, right, I'm going to sit down for four hours and I'm going to type out this novel in two weeks and NaNoWriMo's ending in like, what, three days, two days? So this is a perfect time to just be like, it's difficult to have that accountability and to think that you can write a novel in one month. It is a marathon. It is not a sprint. Yeah. So you have to be kind to yourself. You have to know that it's it's baby steps to reach the end. It is not uh, it is not something that you can commit to four hours a day, every day, just to get it done. And And being understanding of that is a great start. Amazing. Okay, so that's, if you're an author, you're a soon-to-be author, reach out, follow Douglas, go to his website, sign up for these uh, great blog posts, and, and and support Douglas. Like, come on, help the gentleman out here, and, and, you know, provide him that kind of financial freedom to help and support him. I, I'm a big fan of that as well. <laughs> um, Douglas, thank you so much for spending time. And again, keep keep us in mind as as the next, next, next thing comes up. I'd love to have you back again. Oh, it'd be my pleasure. I had such a good time. Awesome. All right. That's great. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us today again. Thank you for subscribing and following. And you're listening this far in the podcast, so you are my best friend. 
I'm sorry, but you are now my best friend. So welcome. Nice to meet you. Thank you for being here. Uh, LivingTheNextChapter.com has a link on the website to our Facebook group. Are you on Facebook? Probably. Uh, you can go there and you can actually interact with our guests. You can talk to them. You can see more about their journey, about their books. You can speak to them directly. You don't need me. You can come right over to LivingTheNextChapter.com. Click on our Facebook link to our community. You can talk to other listeners of the podcast from around the world who are on Facebook. And, again, speak with our guests. Don't you want to speak to the guests you just heard from? Yeah, you can do that on Living the Next Chapter. Go over there. There's links to our Facebook group. And you're welcome to join. Thanks for listening. MindShift Power Podcast, the podcast for teenagers and those who work with them. There's a huge problem in America today. There's a very large disconnect between teenagers and the adults who work with them. I'm looking to bridge that gap with real, raw, honest conversation, not held back by the chains of political correctness. You cannot solve a problem you do not understand. Want to understand teenagers today? Listen to this podcast. This podcast is for teens in the U.S. and Canada. To learn more, go to FatimaBay.com slash podcast, or just look for MindShift Power Podcast on any listening platform. I look forward to you being a faithful listener.